am I going to start again? Shall I start again? Shall I edit this out? Yeah, I'm going to start again. Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Martha from Martha Is. Today's video is all about the Jalak Prize shortlist. So last month I did a video um, looking at the long list for the Jalak Prize and because I was aiming to read them all, I didn't quite finish it so I've just got two left um, which I might, um, which I do really still want to read because they're both like two really good books even though they weren't shortlisted. Um, but yes, today we're talking about the shortlist because the winner of the Jalap Prize will be announced tomorrow. Very exciting. Tomorrow, 6.30pm, I think live on their Twitter and their YouTube, I think. But I will link their accounts down below. Um, so what is the Jalap Prize, if you didn't know? The Jalap Prize is a relatively new prize. So I think this is its fourth year. Um, it was started by an, audi uh, an audience, started by authors um Nikesh Shukla and Sunny Singh and it is all about recognising and honouring um, works of any genre by uh, BAME authors who are British or British resident. Um, so it's a really interesting prize um, because because of that kind of it can be any genre so the other prizes that I tend to have read from for example like the Women's Prize is fiction and novels um, and I've sometimes read the Booker, and again, I think that tends to be novel or is all novels. Um, but because it's any genre, it makes for quite a mix of things, and it's interesting to try and evaluate them side by side. Um, but without further ado, let's get on with the shortlist. So, I made an attempt to read all of the shortlist, and I basically would have succeeded were it not for I actually didn't finish two of them, but deliberately, not because I ran out of time. So, let's talk about those. <laughs> um, so we'll start straight away with um, one that I don't have um, which is called Remembered by Yvonne Battlefelton. So I um, actually tried to read this last year because it was nominated for the Women's Prize for Fiction last year and if you have watched my um, long list video you'll know that I DNF'd it. The reason why I DNF'd it, which is uh, did not finish, the reason why I DNF'd it is because um, reasonably early on in the book it had quite a graphic um, scene of sexual violence against a young girl and I am a sexual violence survivor and so I found that just too difficult um, so it quite badly triggered me and made me feel like very kind of unwell and um, psychologically kind of that's quite sort of destabilizing so um, yeah I had to put it down basically straight away um it was a library book i kind of had to like take it back to the library as soon as possible um so unfortunately i wasn't able to finish that book that said um i have heard very good things about that book from you know several um booktubers so for example simon savage at savage reads absolutely loved it um and you know several others have thought it was very very good so don't let that put you off um reading it if it wins, I guess a part of me will be disappointed because I wasn't able to read the full book and so it's difficult, um, but I'm sure it will be thoroughly deserving if it does win. Let's move on. <laughs> so that's the first one. The second one which I DNF'd is this one, it's Suncatcher by Romesco Gunasquera. Um, so I re was reading this uh, over the last couple of days and um, I gave it about, I think, 80, 85 pages. And I just couldn't get into it, if I'm totally honest. So this is a coming-of-age story, historical fiction, set in the 1960s in a Cy I don't know how you say it, but Ceylon or Cylon, but um, that was what Sri Lanka was previously known as. Um, and it's about a boy um, called Cairo, and he makes a new friend called Jay. And, yeah. So, yeah, 80 pages, I recognise I did not get that far with it, but it, the whole... I realised at that point that I just didn't really, I couldn't get into it and I just didn't really have any attachment or any relation to relationship to the the characters and if it is a coming of age novel it is basically character driven right, it is all about the characters so if you're not really, you know, if that's not pulling you in then it's probably going to be quite hard work and if I'm being totally honest um, this is also symptomatic of the time that I was reading it in that I've been doing um, the pages for periods um, challenge in May so I have been really it's been quite intense there's been like a lot of reading a lot of reading maybe when I wasn't in the mood for reading reading books I wouldn't necessarily have chosen because you know people sponsored me to read them or um, I was reading short books or whatever 
I won't you know, bore you with all of that, but the point is I think I was coming to it and when I was realising that I wasn't getting into it, I just thought I just don't have any energy <laughs> to grow a book that I'm just not enjoying. So I did give up on it. Um, so that is obviously, for obvious reasons, not my pick to win. <laughs> um, so that's the two that I DNF'd. Then we have, um, so we've got four left that I promise you I did read. <laughs> And finished. So we have um, Flush by Mary Jean Chan. This is a collection of poetry. Um, so Mary Jean Chan, she was born, I think she was born in Hong Kong. Yeah, she grew up in Hong Kong and uh, and now lives in London and she is a, um, a lecturer in creative writing and a poet. And so this is all about, um, the, a lot of these poems, there's a lot in there about um, being queer and that queer identity and um, being of Chinese heritage or being Chinese, I don't actually know how she identifies um, beyond that she grew up in Hong Kong. Um, but that kind of, that heritage and there's a lot around her relationship with her mother and her mother's um, experience of growing up in China. Um, yeah, so there's, there's a lot in there which I found really interesting about kind of squaring... Um, queer identities with um with sort of Chinese culture which um it seemed was not certainly from her mother's perspective was not going to be as accepting of queer identities um and yeah and then relationship relation the whole relationship between mother and daughter all of that and I I found it very interesting I could tell there was a lot in there was quite impactful and quite powerful um and again I think if you if you watch my long list video there was this and there was also the poetry collection um, Surge by Jay Bernard where I'm just not a massive fan of poetry. So, And that's actually what makes this prize quite interesting and I imagine really difficult to judge. I don't know how the judges can pick things, can even pick a short, can even pick a long list because it's just so many, such a great variety of the types in here. Like I don't know how you judge a poetry collection against a non-fiction, against a historical fiction, against, yeah... Um, but for me, I find poetry not as interesting. I find it difficult to get into and connect with. So that automatically, yeah, makes it harder to appreciate a, a poetry collection as compared to a novel or, um, or a nonfiction. I, but like, but that said, I saw so much power in here. Um, and a lot of something, a lot of things in there, which I think I didn't really understand fully and couldn't. Um, wouldn't be able to articulate to you now, but I felt was important and profound. So, yeah. So I would say, as poetry collections go, coming from someone who's not a fan of poetry, I thought this was a good one, um, and I would recommend giving it a go. Then we have The Black Flamingo by uh, Dean Atter. So this is a young adult novel in verse, um, so Dean Atter is a, is a poet, um, and so there's kind of, it's a verse novel, but it's also got poems in here. Um, and this is all about the, um, our protagonist, Michael, who is a young boy and he, um, is biracial and he is trying to understand and come to accept that he is a gay man. Um... And so there's a lot in there around, so his, there's kind of absence with his father and there's a lot in there in trying to understand his um, his identity from having a white mother and having a, a black family um, who he sees kind of every now and then, not having the relationship with his father and um, and then and then the element of also being gay and how, how he kind of works through that. And um, I mean, I saw, I'm really making being gay sound like a bad thing that you have to come to terms with. That's not at all what I'm trying to do. <laughs> You know what I mean? It's trying to understand yourself and, yeah, and understand and kind of reconcile that with society's feelings about um, queer identities. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. And he goes to university and he becomes part of a drag club or drag society. Um, and that is a way that he is then able to express himself, express his, um, express his identity as the black flamingo. So I just I found this so interesting. It's such um, a it's an e really easy novel to read because it's told in verse and it's um, YA, which I find tend to be easier to read. So you can whiz through this in no time at all. Um, but it's just it's lovely. It's just really lovely. Um, yeah, what you know, following Michael's 
journey and all the things that he experiences and how he expresses himself and yeah it's lovely and it's uplifting um so yes i would recommend this one uh and then we have one that i don't have with me because i lent to my friend like a million years ago um uh, which is queenie by candice carty williams so i feel like queenie needs no introduction at this point it is you know very well known um it is it's been nominated for so many prizes <laughs> and deservedly so so queenie is a contemporary fiction about a young black woman called queenie um and she and how she's she's kind of going through a rough patch really um with her relationship she's coming out of a relationship which i think is really quite toxic um she's ex you know she's kind of navigating her career as a young woman in the city um and her kind of her relationship with her family and understanding that she's having kind of mental health um challenges and also all of that is kind of happening at the at the same time and she is um and a lot of that is also interspersed with all these instances of everyday racism and i just it's just it is a great book <laughs> it is a really great book i think it's been called the black british jones and i find i actually kind of hate that because it's it's, it's a novel in its own right i mean i i will admit i haven't read british jones bridget jones i've only seen the films but it is a novel in its own right just because it is a novel about a woman who is um a kind of a bit of a mess <laughs> she is kind of a bit of a mess <laughs> then therefore it is a take on Bridget Jones. It's the same way in which, you know, for ages, all the thrillers were like the next Gone Girl and stuff like that. It's totally ignoring that it is a novel in its own right, that it brings its own things to the table, that it's not just, it's not just taking Bridget Jones and making the main character black. I mean, that's, it's basically racist, that session. So let's just, no, I don't like that. Um, it, it's so, but it is so good in the sense that it is, really funny in places so funny so relatable um so you know i am a white woman i don't experience a lot of the things that queenie has experienced but i have also had anxiety issues i've had toxic relationships with men i've had you know confidence issues um i've made questionable decisions i mean so many of the decisions queenie makes you're just like what are you doing <laughs> so um it is a very very good novel um and yeah and like i said it's it's light it is light and it's funny but it also has so much substance to it so i mentioned like the everyday racism i found that so um useful to me from an educational perspective as a white woman to see a lot of those things because a lot of the stuff at the time that i was reading was much more kind of um weighty novels about um about what black people have experienced in terms of racism you know so we're talking like the major like slavery and that sort of thing and here was an example of um these yeah everyday everyday racism these kind of small small microaggressions um that don't seem serious when you take them um in isolation but actually it's ladders up to a whole pattern of um racism and what people have to experience every day and just because it's not you know experiencing like over racist violence it is still its own kind of violence it's its own kind of like continually reminding you that you are an other or that you are less or you know whatever so I thought I haven't seen that many books do it in that way um and that's really accessible and I hope that has also brought that issue to the fore for a lot a lot wider audience I hope um but anyway even if it hasn't in its own right it is just genuinely a fantastic novel <laughs> so very very good I'm very glad that that was shortlisted and deservedly so. So I would say actually that one is probably my second favourite of the shortlist. Um, if that one wins, I will be very happy. Um, but my favourite favourite, which um, again, if you've watched my long list video, this should come as no surprise. My favourite is Afropean by Johnny Pitts. And I really, really hope this wins because this to me is revolutionary i consider it to be revolutionary and that might just be my limited reading but i consider it to be revolutionary i've not come across anything like this before and it is just such an incredible piece of work so this is um a non-fiction it's kind of a travel memoir sort of um so johnny pitts is a biracial man and he is um he has gone traveling around europe to to kind of investigate and explore 
the way that European countries, predominantly white countries, um, perceive race, and well, particularly for black against particularly black people that's what I'm trying to get at but not just black people um, but how do they and how do black people in those countries experience race so this is coming from a perspective of um, a lot of uh, predominantly white countries in the west have kind of gone on this like idea that we are colorblind um, that yeah that that's the way to go is to be colorblind but in actual case in actual fact, what that does is completely um, erases the black experience um, and erases the the racism and the inequality and the structural inequality that absolutely still exists and still affects um, black people and not just black people, you know, people of um, various uh, racial backgrounds. And it was just so fascinating. I, I feel like I'm doing a shocking job of describing this, but it was just so interesting. I mean, the one that sticks out, and I think I said it in my last video, the one that really sticks out to me was in France, where he went and um, and he said that recent legislation had meant that France don't actually acknowledge race, which means that you actually can't collect any data on racism. So, you know, the, the basic, that is this the, the very definition of colourblind and that you're not even willing to accept that race exists and that racism is experienced every day by people, you know, black and minority ethnic people. And ugh, it's just, it's absolutely mind-blowing. I don't understand how that can happen. <laughs> um, so... Yeah, that, so that was just one, that was, I think, probably like half a paragraph in this book. And that's just one that really stuck in my mind. But there's so much in here. Um, you know, so like going to Moscow and how he felt, um, how actually very dangerous it was for him um, in Moscow. And, um, and going to like the south of France and talking about... You know, James Baldwin and that kind of experience. And just, that's ah, just so good. <laughs> And I'm going to have to read it so many more times because I'm just, I, I already would have forgotten so much and there's there's just so much in here and I just have never read anything like this before. I've, and it, Because all of these European countries, we do have, we all have our own cultures, we all have our own separate histories, but they also, they, they also are intertwined and in this case what connects us all is that we are white, um, predominantly white countries and so you don't, a lot of what we talk about and the way we consume race and the whole discourse on racism, I feel, so much comes from America, where of course there's a very, very important, huge conversation about race and racism. But I think I get a lot of my information from there, starting to get more about Britain, but I do not get it from other European countries. And, you know, European countries, it wasn't just Britain that had the empire, it was France, it was, you know, the Netherlands, like there's so much in here that is not being talked about and that is so important to be talked about so there you go that's why I think this should win uh the Dalit prize um I know the winner I'm sure has already been decided because it's being literally announced tomorrow at 6 30 um but if any of the judges are watching this and this is not your winner can you please go and reconsider because <laughs> this is the one that I think needs to win <laughs> um even if it doesn't win read it just read it um yeah so I'm going to stop there. As always, I've kind of been like, oh, I'm only talking about six books. It's going to be a super short video and it is not a super short video. So I'm going to shut up now. Um, as I said, the winner is announced tomorrow, so 26th of May, um, on the Jalik Prize Twitter and YouTube. Um, if you haven't heard of any of these books before, then this is you know, the best opportunity, um, you've got so many exciting books ahead of you, start reading them and, you know, go to the Jalit Prize website, which I will link down below and look at all the previous winners. So you've got people like, um, uh, Guy Garatney, oh, what was the name of it? Our Mad and Furious City, sorry, it's up there. Uh, Guy Garatney's Our Mad and Furious City, uh, won last year. You've also got, um, Rennie Edo Lodge's, uh, Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race fantastic books guys winning this prize so have a look at them have a look at what's in the long list the short list of winners get reading there's just so many fantastic pieces of work in there and i am so grateful for the dalit prize for existing and celebrating these novels and this is a great time to start because apparently there is a guy mowing my lawn literally outside 
<laughs> so I'm gonna go now. Um, if you like this video, please give me a thumbs up. Please subscribe to my channel. I hope you're all well. Let me know in the comments down below if you've read any of these books. If you think a different one should win, tell me. I'd love to know. Um, and I will see you again soon. Bye!